All right, hey, welcome to Champion Leadership Academy. Uh, the boss asked me to put this one on with a specifically officer target. So I took something I had and tailored it a little bit. Uh, this is the second level of the stress management series that I have. Um, here's the big picture of this course. At some point, you may find yourself at FAD CO1 with a soldier whose grandma just died. And most uh, leaders' first instinct when they have a soldier who's experiencing some massive emotions or stress is to take him to Chappie's office for a hug. But if I can't get to FADCO1 in 10 minutes, um, somebody else is going to have to make sure a soldier gets through that significant stressful event. So who's that going to be? Leaders, right? So we are helping extend the leadership level of... Uh, personnel maintenance give some tools that aren't just coming from me there's a lot of leadership experience in this room so I would like to see some cross leveling of things that have worked for y'all in the past especially y'all who are in the NCO time uh, this is a longer class that we're going to kind of blaze through but I don't want conversation not to happen I just don't want to waste your time okay so let's begin here's what we're doing today we are doing what I just said so why are we having this class? Why do we need stress management to be decentralized? Here is the Army's um, picture of care for different levels of stress. At the top you have residential care, so that's, that's you know, long-term inpatient care of a soldier who's got behavioral health issues beyond the capacity of the DOD. We've got behavioral health short-term inpatient, you know, three alpha down at Wynn uh, for more of a three-day experience. We have our behavioral health system, our more specialized systems like Sensi and FAP. Now we live at the bottom two levels, right? So there are the battalion level assets and then there's that important first line leader battle buddy asset. So if you think about this in terms of, of maintenance, Right, you know, if you're down at the motor pool and uh, you have what your maintainers call a 10 level maintenance issue, are they going to do that for you? And they expect you to do your 10 level maintenance um, and not elevate everything up. But what we've seen uh, is that these levels of care are taking longer and longer to get ongoing appointments, right? Um, to get in with a psychiatrist, if a soldier needs psychiatry care, right now that's about a two month wait. Uh, we don't even have a psychiatrist here anymore, it's a, it's a telehealth visit. Um, and so we're seeing a huge bottleneck at the behavioral health level. Um, and so what we want to do is try to get some skills at the lower level of care. Uh, that didn't really work out. Some skills at the lower level of care. Here. Uh, at the first line leader level so we're not escalating all issues. So if we can manage the stress of our soldiers at the lower levels, they don't grow over time into bigger issues, okay? So that's what we're after today. So the first step is uh, just a shorter version of individual stress management. How do we manage stress at the individual level? Um, but keep in mind, you are looking at this through the lens of how can I give this tool to a subordinate who is having, having a major significant event. Um, can anybody think of a time and maybe share quickly when they had somebody under their care who had a big emotional event and, and how did you handle it with limited resources? Yeah, uh, so when I went down to CO1, there was, so at mid-tour, there was a new group coming in, um, and one of them, you guys, one of the soldiers you know, uh, Brianna Ortiz, um, she came down as a, as a backseater, and um, she didn't know at the time that she was pregnant, yeah. um, so she gets down, and she, whatever, that's what I'm going to do with the on stick, right? And figure out that they're pregnant. So at some point, she suspects she's pregnant, finds out she's pregnant. She, it's like day three down there. So I had the decision of whether or not I put her on the airplane you know, because she had already done a progression flight. And in case you guys may not, I'm not going to get into the backseat equipment and, and like the bands of, of like 
frequency and whatnot that it emits. But if you're around it for too much, whatever. Anyway, so we'll, we'll sideline that discussion for cancer. Uh, but if uh, if you're gestating a child, I can't imagine that it's probably a good thing to do. So she she was willing to stick around for her first trimester, but I had a decision of uh, do I send her back? Do I keep her down there the whole time? Do I, and this wasn't, wasn't and this is like an immediate, like within the first 20 minutes thinking in my head, uh, after after having a conversation with Colonel Rouser, um, you know, we, we kicked around some ideas, but also they said, what do you, you know, what do you want to do? She can legally, the doc said she can legally fly the first trimester. And I sent her home that, like that weekend. Um, but, because there was no way I was going to take a baby deformity. I can I can take your deformity, but I can't take a baby's deformity on, on my hands, all right? So, not you, Mr. Howard. Any of it really is going to make you all feel better. It's too that's, late that's for me. Like, that's like a, it, it's not really like a, anything, you know, that's not like a, someone dying or something like that. No. Finding out you have a baby on board. That's a lot of stress yeah. to manage. For sure. And you adapted one of the strategies that we'll talk about. So, so we'll put a pin in and come back. So first, somebody give me a, an example of what stress is. Well, or not an example, a definition. The non-specific response of the body to aid manifest There you go. Very specific. <laughs> awesome. Here's some others. Uh, stress can be defined as a force. Uh, the, the, the tension factor. Uh, and also an ongoing state. Like I said, we're going to blaze through these faster to get to the leadership section. Uh, the effects of stress are not always bad, right? Stress is your body's response to getting something done quickly, um, but it can sometimes overflow, right? Uh, and that's what we want to avoid. So there are two types of stress, acute stress and chronic stress. What are the differences? One long term, one short term. Yeah. So what's an example of an acute stressor? I still might tell. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a one-time event. I just have to get through that one event, and then it's over. What's a chronic stress? Maybe like the issues. finance, exactly. Yeah. My job. Yeah, something that you can't immediately fix or get out of, and sometimes those two things combined are what cause us the biggest issues. Right? Uh, is stress always bad? There's a good there's a good amount, right? Like like you know, when, when the boss asked me yesterday about about my height and weight situation, that's a good amount of stress to motivate me to not eat this delicious Panera lunch. Right? To, it stressed me out to make good choices. Now it becomes bad stress when it starts to impact other parts of my life negatively. Right? If I were to begin to make myself throw up in the latrine, then, then that became a bad stress. So when I can't sleep at night, when I'm taking it out on my kids, right? when, when there's that overflow. And so channeling the good stress is a good way. Now we do have a lot of coping techniques that are not so healthy. These are things we see a lot in, in our junior soldiers especially. So let me talk about a couple of these. Um. Hey, Chad, still important. Yes, sir. Why well, I asked him to give this class is from my perspective, and it's all enlightening because I have so much experience in the Army. So there's a big gap. Who in here has been in the Army? Who in here is older than 28 years old? The, the majority of this room is older than 28 years old. Um, I'm seeing that 25 year olds and under which is about 70 or so percent of the formation, something has changed in the public school system, in parenting techniques, in, in whatever it is. Something's changed in the American culture that for the most part, 25 year olds and below don't have the ability yet to recognize stress. What it's doing to them, how it's causing them to behave, why are they not thinking clearly? Yeah. Um, why are they not performing as good as they did six months ago? Whether it's at their job, whether it's at PT, whether it's at their hobby. And they don't understand what we're going through today. And so I asked them to set the scene. Um, 
So we can have conversations about it, and we're not going to do them in this hopeful we'll song. The idea is that you guys leave here and have conversations about it, and the, the idea is that you engage with the 25 and below population, wherever that line falls, and have these conversations, start the education process throughout. Uh, because unfortunately, the second half of our society right now um, doesn't value life. Mm. And whatever you want, political, religious, wherever you want to take that, it is where it is. Uh, and there's like these really, I have kids that are that age of, they're allowed to have screens. And it's really fucking scary when you read the, the uh, post-mortems of how a teenager commits suicide or how a service member commits suicide. And I don't want this class to be like suicide prevention. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're, we're here to talk about well left of that and having a healthy, productive climate. But the unfortunate reality is that the time it takes from a, a young soldier or your own child or your best friend to go from just not being able to deal with stress to the answer being suicide has really decreased a significant amount of time. There's a lot of studies on it. And the Army suicide prevention thing, the care card, ACE, and all that, like we, we kind of spooled that up for a little bit. Maybe it helped, maybe it didn't. I don't know. There are a couple things that, um, so that's the scene setter for why we want to do this. So if we're going to talk about coping techniques, yes, I was picking on them yesterday for a second. Wait, I also assess that our relationship, we have the rapport that we can have that conversation and that he's not going to go believe and call me. Um, things like that. But it, it really comes down to knowing your soldiers. I'll get off my soapbox and sit down and let you guys take over the class. With one last story to set the scene. 15th MI, sister, sister battalion, um, soldier leaves a group chat. Two NCOs kind of know the soldier pretty well. Like, all right, whatever. Soldier is not at PT the next morning at 6.30. Um, I have a hard time with suicide, so I don't like cry. Uh, so those two NCOs took those two indicators and didn't say like, hey, you know, we'll go find them after PT or like, hey, we don't have to send it to purse that till nine o'clock. They were just two anomalies and they knew their soldier well enough to be like, fuck, yeah, we gotta go find this dude. And they found him in a car with all the tools he needed and he would not unlock the door. So they had to break the window and get him out of the car. They took him to the emergency room. He's in inpatient care at the top of that pyramid that we're talking about. But the fact of the matter of these classes and stuff, again, I don't want to be a suicide prevention or suicide awareness. I want it to be a healthy leadership discussion. Knowing your people, knowing having that, those NCOs actually know their soldier to the level of like, people can leave group chats and get picked on, ah, no big deal. You, you can easily wash either of those indicators away if you don't just fucking know your people. Um, so that's a big part of it, and then I, again, so that being the worst day that I hope to God we never lived through together, but let's, let's talk left of that, and let's just talk about peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, there's, there's different techniques and things, um, as well as a lot of, who's a warrant officer here, who's a pilot in here? How many soldiers do you talk to on a daily basis? You know, like how many like junior enlisted soldiers do you guys see? Two, two, three, maybe. It's, it's generally like the same one or two. Okay, so maybe some of this stuff is in here, but may, maybe it is applicable as peer to peer, right? And maybe it breaks down a little bit a couple of barriers that you guys peer to peer can have conversations. A lot of the chron uh, chaplains said, "What's chronic stress?" For me, chronic stress that I literally wake up at night is air airframe divestment. It fucking keeps me up at night. And there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. The Army's gonna give and take our equipment. I can I can advocate all day long until I'm blue in the face, but I still lose sleep over it. And it's fucking wearing on me 14 months into command. And I'm on the back side of the way out, so it doesn't really affect me. You guys, on the other hand, that's a legitimate fucking stressor that we're all just kind of like washing away. But you can't tell me that's not building in the background as to what that means to your future, your lives, your families, your financial situations, your readiness in the army, what you want to do. I mean, it, it boils over so many things. So hopefully, leaving out of this class, we have set the environment, the climate, or the culture that we understand that if somebody wants to talk about some of this stuff, okay, maybe we do put our screen down, go grab a beer, and talk about it. Maybe we don't solve anything, but maybe we just talk about it. Um, and maybe 
through that, we can turn down the temperature a touch to we go back to just being thankful that we're surrounded by a bunch of fucking great people. We're in a fucking great place, and we're in the best fucking army in the world. Ah, oh, yeah, it's kind of shitty in our segment of it, but, you know, maybe we can find something there that we can all laugh about, have a beer over, and come back and get back after it the next day. Uh, and just not let it build to that boiling point. Um, so not suicide prevention class, but just wanted to kind of frame what I'm seeing as a battalion commander with our junior population, and where are my... Uh, captains and lieutenants that are less than six years of service. Yeah, like this class is really designed for y'all. Pick the brains of everybody in it. This, like what I just described as I'm seeing, it, it's a, it's all, all but in my rear view, that is the army that you're gonna lead. That is the company that you're gonna command. That is the operations officer challenge that you're gonna have doing force generation. Um, and I don't see we're gonna shoot behind the power curve as an institution on this. So what we do is individual leaders about it. And all you do as an individual leader about it is what can I touch here today to make it better? So, all right, I'm done. Class is yours, Chef. I won't say anything for the rest of the morning. I don't know, sir, you got all the high points. So it, it really is going to boil down to knowing, knowing your soldier's baseline, assessing that they're off of their baseline, or your battle buddy or whomever Right, knowing them well enough to know when they're off and then offering a tool to try to return them to baseline. I mean, that is the technique that, that's being taught here today. And, and that is to do that early enough to avoid the issue compounding to the worst case scenario. Um, we can't control everything, we can't control everybody's actions, but I do firmly believe that if there's enough of an early uh, uh, intervention um, that those issues don't compound. So thank you, sir. Uh, harmful coping techniques. Does anybody have anyone on here that, that I'm missing? I think maybe a sister to overbooking is is uh, workaholism. I think that that is one in the officer corps that's going to be different than, than maybe some of our younger enlisted friends. <clears throat> workaholism is is a stress uh, a stress reliever in some capacity, especially if your stress is at home. Right, and you want to avoid that stress, so you, you dive into your work stuff. What do you think is the battalion's biggest problem from the brigade's perspective? Uh, since I'm talking to the, to the leaders here, D-Rugs. there you go. Yep, and so it was pressed upon me that this is this was one of the ways that I offered up to the brigade chaplain to, to tell his boss how we're getting after the battalion's drug problem, which is solving core issues, not you know the DARE program. Okay. So we're going to get give – these are the five quick tools at the individual level before I get to the leadership, the five tools that we're going to offer to uh, deal with stress. So when someone is having a stressful situation, here are the five techniques. We're going to teach avoiding the stressor, altering the stressor, adapting to it, accepting it, uh, and then the one prerequisite, which is adopting a healthy lifestyle before you get there. So the first one is avoiding the unnecessary stresses. When can you just take that thing out of your life? When are you adding too much stress to you that you could ultimately just get rid of? Um, does anybody, can anybody think of an example of an unnecessary stress that maybe a soldier or you've experienced that, you know, you just, just delete it and be done with it? I have an example, but I want you guys to tell not necessarily a stressor, but more of a distraction. I know like a lot of social media platforms. Great. Yes. So thank you. That's exactly the one I was going to use. So when I was in Korea, a lot of these younger soldiers would be so depressed because Sally back home is taking pictures on Instagram out with the boys and she's not telling me about it and we're fighting about it and I can't stop looking at Instagram. And so I would just say, then delete Instagram. Focus on your relationship. And if that is causing you stress, just delete the app. Excellent example, thank you. Uh, we'll keep going just to get to the leadership portion. Okay, can we change your situation? Can you alter the stressor itself? So I have a lot of things that are causing me stress. How can I change it to make it better? How can I change that relationship to make it better? How can I change whatever that thing is that's causing me stress. Can anybody give an example of something that causes stress that can be changed? I do this for myself. I have, uh, I think I've told a couple of you about this. I have a 
15 minute time limit on Facebook every day. It's good. I, and once it hits that limit, I don't go back on it. It's, it's yeah. My, my current stressor, here's what I changed. I have my wife pack my lunches now. So it's packed a little bit more smartly, see? Although she cooks dinner, which is really the cause of her problem, but. It's her fault. It is, I blame my wife. Now some stressors cannot be changed, cannot be taken away. So they have to be adapted to in the moment. So how can you adapt yourself to fit the stressor? I have an example, but does anybody have, have one that they can share? Of, of something that's a stressor in life that you can change yourself to fit? You got a mustache. You got a mustache. You got a, <laughs> yeah, give me some. I told you, you ate my bribe, so you have to participate. That's the contract. I'll go and talk to people at the cab and see how their lives are. Good. Usually that makes my life feel a lot better. Okay. A little schadenfreude a <laughs> to make yourself feel better. Yeah. How about if you have a difficult, uh, you know, a difficult work relationship, like a, a really difficult supervisor or something? Maybe you change the way that you communicate with that person, right? You you can't sit around and hope that they're going to change and get better, right? But maybe if you come at them, you know, speaking their love language in a non-romantic sense, if you, you know, to change the situation for the better, right? So teaching an adaptation. I, I know MRT is kind of silly sometimes, but I do fully believe in the hunt the good stuff. Sometimes it's about reframing your situation. Uh, or as the meme, shows sometimes something as easy as changing your socks that's a joke but on a ruck march how great i know you aviators don't do a lot of that anymore but how great is that change of socks when it's time right like that small thing is cherry for me gummy bears on a ruck march make all the difference just pop one in every 20 steps that little sugar burst helps uh, for this next one this is a quote from who's read man's search for meaning anybody read that Incredible book, absolutely incredible book. Victor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor uh, who, who wrote down what he saw in the camps and his, his ultimate thesis came down to the people that made it and the people that didn't came down to attitude. Ultimately, they could not change the horror around them. They could not escape it. The only thing, the last thing that they had control over was their mind. And what was different for him was they never broke his mind. It's an amazing book, I highly recommend it. Uh, but his quote here is, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. And this is kind of our last bastion. This is the end. If there's nothing left to fix your situation, you still have control over your mind. And sometimes, here's the deal though, when we're dealing with acute stress, and we're gonna get to this a little bit in the next section, when you get to acute stress uh, and it becomes distress, your chemical systems in your body do take over. So your brain functions less at the executive level and it moves down into the uh, irrational level and then down into the survival level depending on how bad your stress is. So you can't always think your way through problems. So sometimes you have to learn techniques to bring your brain, or in this case, your subordinate's brain, to help bring them out of survival brain back to rational brain. Does that make sense? That's just chemicals. That's just how this machine is built. And so there are things, that, the mindfulness thing, people laugh at it, but there truly is something scientific about experiencing different physical sensations. So people have like, you know, stress balls that they squeeze or different things that they smell that return their mind from the, the chemical loop on the problem down here in the survival brain and slowly bring them out into their rational brain. Does that make sense? There are scientific terms, but this is a science class. So not the amygdala. Okay. Um, so sometimes uh, bringing someone out of stress is really about reducing the inflammation of that chemical flush of cortisol, right? getting them through that chemical flush, which takes 20 to 30 minutes for your brain to process a dump of cortisol. So it goes through you, it's what we call fight or flight, right? That cortisol dumps in your brain, it gets in your blood system, your heart rate goes up, uh, all different other physiological things are happening to you 
in 30 minutes, that thing has changed. The problem is the younger kids will seek a harmful coping mechanism during that cortisol flush, like excessive alcohol or, you know, physical rage or whatever. And that kind of, the, what the opposite of a golden window is, uh, gets sidelined. So how can we get our subordinate through that 20, 30 minute cortisol flush back to where they're thinking? Does that make sense? So that's what this, this slide is all about. Does anybody else have anything on that one? Any practices for how to stay in the moment? Actually, the age-old drink water and drive on. Yeah. Drinking water is one of the ways that resets your breathing pattern back to the baseline. And so it yeah. can potentially reduce your stress in the moment by just taking a sip of water. It's actually an interview and interrogation technique to drink water before you respond so that you don't get too excited or whatever. You can take that, Alex, for it. Oh yeah, I guess if you've been through Siri, you've gotten a couple of these, I would imagine. Um, the practice of box breathing, and you may know box breathing, right? Um, the science behind that is the breathe out mechanism. So if you hold your breath, right? Like you hold it for a long time, your body experiences panic, right? Because there's excess bad gases building up in your system and your body says, I need to get them out. The science behind box breathing is the exhale also produces a trace amount of dopamine because your body is saying, I need to get rid of these gases to survive. So when you control your breathing, that exhale is dumping small amounts of dopamine into your body. If you do that long enough, the dopamine overtakes the cortisol flush. So there actually is benefit. It's not just hippie stuff. There is scientific benefit to control breathing. All right. This is the one that really matters. Prepare for the stress before it comes, right? If you're the kind of person who has prepared for stress, then when stress comes, it's more available to you in the moment. You have more tools available to you in the moment. For example, sleep. If you're taking a big exam, when is your most important night of sleep? Two nights prior. Two nights prior. It's not the night before. Right? It's two nights prior. Exactly right. So are we as leaders doing that PMCS on our soldiers, on our battle buddies, to make sure that they have enough resilience built before the bad thing happens? And so as a leader, this is something we'll get into later, are you checking on those things before you meet them in your soldiers? Good relationships, good finances, good self-care techniques, um, those kinds of things. All right. And we'll skip that one and we'll move on to the, the good part, leadership, stress management. So why is it important for leaders to be involved in the stress of their soldiers? What do we get as an organization when leaders are actively involved? Better organization. How so? Well, if the, the force is healthy, then we can achieve whatever we need to achieve. Okay. Good. So less of the negative, we get more of the positive. What's the positive benefit? Efficiency. Yeah, we talked about this in my last class. Thank you. In the, in the uh, last class I talked down at Alpha, we get efficiency and we get trust. Trust is the currency for leadership. If you've been in any of my other Champion Leadership Academies, I'm big on teaching organizational trust. The Army's rank system guarantees compliance by the point of a gun. Ultimately, you will comply with the legal order either now or in Leavenworth. Um, but the rank system does not get you that quickly. Trust is what gets compliance. And so uh, that's why we, I want us to be involved and so we can stop our issues rising to the top of the pyramid. So when leaders uh, create that environment early, we get to these problems before they uh, grow. Because nobody comes out of the womb and is suicidal. Generally, generally, it's a compounding system of issues over time. Uh, and also, again, chemically, brains that are in stress mode for too long create maladaptive patterns for getting out of stress later on. The longer you're in stress, the harder it is to get out of stress. So if we teach our soldiers to get out of stress quicker, 
then it's easier for them to get out on their own later. Does that make sense? Awesome. So what's the difference between these two guys? Is it any of these factors? That's the one, right? But really, well, what's the difference? Kevin Sobel was not unskilled. His Latin F was very, there's not supposed to be a fence here. But why did people care about Winters? Because he cared about that. He cared about that. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the strategy for how to manage the, subordinate, the stress of our subordinates. So the boss already talked about this first one. We have to identify stress in our soldiers. To identify stress in our soldiers, we have to know what they look like at rest, right? That's, that's how the lie detector test works. You see what somebody looks like at rest, and then you put them under duress so you can see the difference. And so when you cause them to lie, their bodies will go under duress and you can read the machine. So if you don't know your soldier at rest, if you don't know your soldier at normal, then it's going to be harder for you to detect the difference between dropping out of a group chat because the group chat is just annoying and they text too much or because there's a serious issue. So I give leaders who aren't good at their interpersonal skills just a quick acronym. Some people aren't great at the talkings. Uh, of, of what things to look for in a conversation. And I say check their oil. Make sure their occupational uh, standard hasn't changed much. Make sure their interpersonal life is roughly the same. And make sure that they have a life outside of, of this. Because it's easy to put on this uniform and fake it, uh, but then go home and have a horrible life. So if they don't have a life to look forward to outside of this uniform, that's an indicator of a problem as well. So check their oil. Are you good on that one? All right, here's the one I, I would want. This is for my NCOs. I force them to write this down. These are my four magic bullets for how to detect soldier issues early. I want, if I could force one thing into this battalion and any battalion I work for, every monthly counseling would have this conversation. How are your relationships? How are your finances? How's your behavioral health? And how are we helping you reach your career goals? What's the point of asking these questions every month? Because those are probably the biggest factors. Yeah. What if you just get the same response every month for eight months and then you stop asking on the ninth? So you don't care? Yeah, and maybe you've missed a life change. If they just say good every time, great. But if you start to see early a finance change, then Later, you're not having to have them explain to Alex why they're having their, their clearance revoked. So this is, this is big for me. I've seen people implement these and make a huge difference. So having that conversation, it's all about showing that empathy. Now, some of you have been through my empathy class, so I'm not going to make that one go longer. If you haven't been through my empathy class, I'll do it again. Before I leave, I recommend getting in on it, but it's all about how to have that open, engaging conversation. It's not about softness, it's not about hugs, uh, not, Chaplin is not a hugger, right? But it's about making sure that communication is actually two-way communication. But is a soldier gonna automatically trust you? Never. So what do you do when they don't want to open up to you when you do ask those questions? change that font. It's a little small. So they just say, I'm fine, but you're noticing things. You're noticing that they're late. You're noticing they're, you know, yelling on the phone on their break or furiously texting. Or it might just be like a change of like tone or intention. So they might be like reading you. It's like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's noticing I'm showing up late rather than like, hey, I'm really concerned for you. Like, is there something going on? How can we help you? Yes. Be more efficient. Awesome. Absolutely right. So how are your nonverbals? How is the tone? How's the environment? Are you asking down at the motor pool while well, there's a bunch of people around? Or did you kind of create an environment where there's more of a uh, trust there? Excellent. Anyone else on this one? At the end of the day, though, this is not an interrogation. I know the Army doesn't treat us as such, but these are adults. 
So you can't make them to say something that uh, they are not going to say. But as long as you can look in the mirror and say, I've done everything I can to create a trusting environment with integrity. And you're not just saying, come to me if you need something. There are a lot of leaders who think it's good enough to say, hey, my door is always open. Come to me if you need something. Why is that not sufficient? Yeah, maybe they, that's good. Maybe they're too young to, to recognize that they have a bigger issue. That's, that is good. That, it wasn't even what I was thinking, but that's good. Yeah. Or most people, man, that's a long walk. Yeah. That's a long walk to your boss's office to talk about how you have something going on at home or yeah. something like that. And leadership, right, it's not, it's not just about the rank and the pay, right, but it's about the life experience too. You've walked the road a little bit longer, so you've got something to offer. And a lot of soldiers also have been burned by the army system. You know what I mean? Like they've, they've had leaders in the past who've burned them. And so you are overcoming some of the leaders of the past. I mean, who among us have had really crappy leaders in the past? Yeah, especially if you were enlisted in your younger days, right? There was a different culture. Um, well, the big army has said, that's not the way we're doing things anymore. Like it or hate it, the army is saying, hey, we're gonna invest in these human beings that have cost the army a lot of money to create as soldiers, uh, we're gonna invest in them long term, which means maintenance is active, it's not passive. Okay? Um, so I think what we're really getting at on this one, again, I think there's about six or seven folks that said this class was primarily, my primary audience here is a bunch of captains and different lieutenants. Authenticity, I think that's, that's what we're really getting at. How do you do this in an authentic way? Um, and it's so, and if you, with lieutenants, I've talked to you guys in your counselors, it's so awkward. I fucking hate it being a lieutenant. It's just so awkward. Like, oh, I'm supposed to go to Motor Pool Monday. I was told to ask, hey, Hawk, how are you doing today? Do you like football? You don't like football? I don't have anything to talk to you about. <laughs> but, like, so how, how do you, it, it is, it, it's just awkward. And that, that first, like, 90 days as a company commander, more so than as a lieutenant, they're definitely not going to want. Um, so how do you do it in an authentic way? I'm not going to slow down the class. I would offer uh, for those individuals interested in talking about delivering this in an authentic way when it's your turn. It's your turn every day, to be clear. It's more so your turn when you're a designated platoon leader, XO, company commander. Hit up Gray, hit up Anya. Uh, it's most fresh in their minds. Um, and in my opinion, they both did it well when it was their turn to do it. So um, this point of this class, again, is to breed conversation out of the class. If you're the lieutenant that just really struggles at motor pool Monday, if you're the lieutenant that walks into uh, the flight planning room and like just, you, you literally like put your shoulders down, your head down a little bit, you go and you start filling out your raw and you hope to God none of the war officers ask you anything, that is normal. First off, I'm just trying to establish that's normal. Like it, I was there. Um, talk to talk to Anya, talk to Gray, uh, and just hey, did you go through it? And then just have a conversation about it. Um, but yeah, comes back to the the uh, syllable winner saying authenticity. So how do you do that? And it has to be you. It can't it can't be something that you learn from a class? But you have to put a proactive effort into self-developing it if it is a weakness of yours. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and another pitch for my empathy class. If, if y'all want it sooner, it, it I think it's really helpful. The Army has regulation, regulative guidance on empathy. Um, there's actually Army doctrine on how to be an empathetic leader, and it's just not taught. It's required of us. It's on our OERs, right? It is part of the character assessment on your OERs that you've displayed empathy. And so I kind of helped develop some of those tools for people who just don't naturally have it because not everybody had a good parent or a good coach that taught them how to communicate with empathy, but it is expected of you as a leader. So let's say a soldier does open up, you're ready to hear them. Uh, so how do you not miss that moment, 
right? The window is not always open to have a good conversation with the soldier. But if it does open, they do open up to you. They are willing to trust you with the thing that's stressing them out. Now, how do you not ruin it? I've seen a lot of times where soldiers do, you know, build up that courage to have that tough conversation, but the leader just was not ready for that moment. So are you able to actively, reflectively listen, not say things like, this is literally a conversation I had an NCO brought a soldier into my uh, office. The soldier was crying. This is when we were in Korea. The soldier was crying because the wife sent him divorce papers. And so the three of us were having this conversation. I'm just trying to calm the soldier down. NCO literally says, hey, I'm on my third divorce. It's not that bad after a little while. <laughs> Bro, you are the last person I need giving advice right now, and that is the last thing I need to be said. Yeah, you need to go get us some cups. He was trying to help. Right? He, he was trying to show that he cared, not the way to do it. Right? I was at a funeral not too long ago, and the wife was crying. Literally, somebody who just worked with the husband said, I know what you're going through. We just lost our dog, and it's been hard to get over. It truly happened. So part of that leadership technique is to be a little bit more thoughtful and prepared with not ruining the moment once they do begin to open up. We touched on this a little bit earlier. Your soldier's stress is too far out of the box. It is not, they are not ready for a conversation. It is not rational conversation time, right? Now, I'm just gonna keep telling career stories because I have them. A lot of times I would get, you know, Friday night, soldiers drunk and they're crying and throwing things and NCOs just like, I don't know what to do. Chaplain, have it fix my soldier, right? And I would just say, put them to bed. They need to sleep. They need to get out of this mode. Get them a shower. I'm not going to talk them into a new life transition at this moment while they're punching holes in the wall and they're drunk, right? And even if they're not drunk, let's just say it's just, you know, shouting and yelling. And so I had a soldier who was in that mode, started cussing at his NCO in my office, and NCO took that moment to say, hey, you better watch who you're talking to and say that to me at parade rest. I'm like, bro, not the time. Should we address customs and courtesies? Generally, sure, not the time. This soldier is crying, punching, wants to kill himself. Now's not the time to talk about parade rest, right? Um, now we need to just remove the inflammation. Think of it like, think of stress and distress Right, like you've got a bad splinter deep in your finger. Every time you try to go with it at the tweezers, you just can't get past the swelling. Now you need to get the splinter out, but you're not gonna get there till the swelling goes down. And that's distress, right? We gotta get out of the, out of the survival brain, out of lizard brain, and slowly rise up into rational brain. So let the emotions happen. Don't be afraid that soldier is having emotions. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Does this sound challenging? Anybody think, well, my recruiter did not tell me I would have to care about this when I signed up. But you do, this is leadership, right? Hey, yeah, I, I just, listen, I keep talking, but I got like three weeks left on the job. So I'm, I'm just trying to like, this is not because I like care of myself. This is because I, I really want you guys to realize this. Like the army was different. You guys all know this. The army was different when you joined, got it. There's different levels of stress that you can manage that guys 20 years before you, things that were super stressful to you, they thought was a joke. You know, like, I'm on my third divorce, what are you talking about? You know, those kind of comments. So just understand that when you approach somebody, we used to have a, like, who's, who's all been an NCO in here? So NCOs used to be the most powerful people in the Army, bar not. Walking and it's, it's, and it's because they could grab you by the shoulder, go to your barracks room, and put you in your shower when you're drunk. And there wasn't a damn thing you could do about it because the NCO Corps would protect itself. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I never slept in that night, you know, that kind of thing. But what we lost with the everyone cares about hugs and kisses now, um, the, it, what, what it's, it's actually labeled intrusive leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're, you love your people. And so you're gonna be intrusive sometimes in order to manage their wellness. There's, there's got to be, and 
our new generation of the Army, a balance with that. I mean, you, nowadays, if I grabbed one of you guys and took you to your shower, put you in your shower, if you would have told, if you would tell somebody, they would have to act on it, whatever, investigations, everything, is he a rapist, that kind of thing. But really, that was just commonplace of taking care of dudes. So that Korea situation, two NCOs could have grabbed this guy, put him in a shower, and just actually been talking, like sitting by him in the shower, and been like, whenever you're ready to get out, man, this cold water will stop, you know, and we'll, we'll have a conversation about it. And you can go to bed and we'll talk about it in the morning, uh, that kind of thing. So it, it like, it's as silly as it sounds, this is actually, the leaders aren't, so 18 year old Aaron, or excuse me, 18 year old Washburn, loses his mind about something, gets frantic, starts crying, punching the wall or whatever. 25 year old Sergeant Washburn is supposed to talk him off the ledge. So the NCO doesn't even have the capability to respond to the distress. That's what we're talking about here. So it's it's like, it's gonna have to be a rapid education of caring about folks. And you're all really good at, the guys with docs, you're all really good about this because when you go to CO1, you go on CI, you're already, you know, you, you're not part of the command team, but you have influence on the command team. And you can often advocate for voices. And then you can, you can also just be a part of the team and listen to, listen to their concerns. So you have a lot of power to like, I just want to remind you, you have a lot of power to respond to this and teach the NCOs how to respond to it because rarely are you going to be handling the 18 year old but you probably will handle the NCO that's freaking out you know especially if they act unprofessionally in front of everyone else you're going to be the one that pulls them aside because Lieutenant Whiting as awesome as he is he doesn't have the mileage to do that and and frankly you should feel like you have the power to do that if that makes sense sorry rent complete no good deal thank you a little bit of science behind distress is cortisol creates cortisol. So part of the herd mentality of mammals is if you see that fight or flight response in another, your fight or flight response is going to kick off at the same time, right? Because, oh, they saw a T-Rex before I saw a T-Rex. They're running. I better run. Does that make sense? So part of the – and this is very true if you're married. Like you, you know that you've seen that in a relationship, right? So part of the leadership skill is don't get ramped up just because they're getting ramped up. Like my, like my NCO who said, don't yell at me, you better, who are you talking to? That was his own fight or flight kicking in, making it about his ego, rather than staying grounded, staying centered, and saying, I'm not going to get ramped up with you, you need to come down here with me. And a big piece of this is that preventative portion. So just like we're telling our soldiers, hey, prepare for stress before stress comes, it's the same. I need to prepare for my subordinate stress before their stress comes. Are you ready for when soldiers, NCO's grandma dies? You heard she was sick three weeks ago because you have a relationship with them that has prepared you, that they can have the conversation and say, I'm very worried that my grandma's sick. Three weeks later, grandma dies. Have you been preparing for that along the way? Again, you may say to yourself, why do I have to do this? I didn't join the Army for this. But the Army is not about planes. It's not about tanks. It's not about bullets. The Army is about teams. It is the number one thing that the Army creates is teams of human beings. And so it is a it is a human endeavor that we participate in. So I think it's an important skill. Good. And then after you've done all that, the, in, in the leadership portion, you offer them the coping strategies. And uh, I had to cut some of this to, to make this go down to an hour. You also help them with emotional processing. I'll teach that at Stress Leadership 301, Emotional Processing. But a final word on this is make sure you are doing your own self-care. As leaders, you have to be doing that stuff first. So model self-care. Make sure you're a person of trust and integrity so you can be trusted. Uh, if you're not taking care of yourself, then you're not going to be able to take care of anybody else. So before we let the boss have a final say, does anybody have any questions? Before I hand it over to him and before I release you, I need three Good final analytical thoughts from people who haven't talked. What in this class has made you think, changed your life, something you totally disagree with? I need three, or you're all prisoners here. I spoke already, but it was something I kind of That's felt fair. I say. fair. Just being, being in a position for having a 
being able to say something, if you're worried about ruining a relationship with a soldier, if you see something, say something. Because the regret of you know having an action or maybe really ruining a relationship, I've never heard of anybody getting in trouble from their leadership by saying something, but it wasn't ended up being something that was significant. Yeah. But seeing leaders before having a lot of regret after something catastrophic happened to a soldier or that a soldier did yeah. severely outweigh any type of action that they could have said. So Absolutely. just always lean on the side of caution and you can always heal a relationship if you can give people back or kind of forgive them for doing something really severe. Especially if you have a context. Hey, I'm bringing this up because I saw you do this, mm -hmm. right? If you bring up that context, then it's not an intrusive. Right? Very good. All right, that's one. As far as the page about uh, stressors, most of us in here are pilots, and so we could talk at nauseum about stresses, and you know, it's just something we talk about all the time. So it was interesting to see a different perspective than kind of what we're used to. Very cool. Yeah, I think one of the things that has helped me, like junior officer, pilot, is especially like not becoming overwhelmed, is recognizing like, what can I control in this moment, because it's super easy to be like, there's all these factors, all these things I need to consider in the cockpit as a junior officer. So just recognizing what you can control, what you can actually impact, yeah. and then figuring out, all right, how, how am I going to get from A to B with what I can control? Because there's some things where you just can't, yeah. unfortunately, especially in the Army. So yeah, just distilling it down to what exactly can I influence in this moment and then moving forward. That's, That's good. That's getting from middle brain to, to high brain, right? Is I'm rational enough to take the next step, but I'm not ready to, to worry about the big picture. So let me just get through the next couple steps. Very good. Thank you. Sir, anything else from you? Thank you. Sure. Well done. I don't know if I told you we were drafted or not. So we can talk about that next time. And then I think this is good shit. I think we can relieve time limitations and then just open the door for people to come. If they get a go, they got a go type thing. Feel like there's hopefully coming out of this. There's there's conversation. I'll mandate a conversation for the uh, lieutenants and captains. And uh, I didn't know if Greg was here or not, but I'm gonna stick around. Um, and I'll I'll share some of the things that I wanted this class to be designed towards. To the more officers, thank you um, for coming. I know you probably had a choice to make. I 